Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. So this is the one minute silver chart, and you can see the Fed event here. This is the announcement by Yellen that we're going to get three rate hikes next year. And I guess the classical economic explanation means that that's going to clamp down on inflation and that will be bad for precious metal prices. But we all know that those are manipulated. So interesting action here. You can see the sell off from about the high of 1720 down to 1680, about a 40 cent loss and then drifting lower. And then we have this absolutely bizarre activity at about 11 p.m. Eastern time of a big rally and then a crash and now we're rallying back. So what's going on in the silver market? Who knows? It's absolute craziness. Uh, looking at the long term, again, as I said before, most of the damage has already been done. It, it, it doesn't look nearly as bad as gold, whereas gold now, if we look on the daily chart, uh, it's, well, this is a weekly, but it's looking really ugly. The The trend is something like uh, right in here. So uh, a break below 1100 on gold is uh, the bottom falls out. We just don't even know how low it's going to go if it breaks below 1100. And so I stand by my call that gold is very overvalued relative to silver. Of course, both of them are extremely undervalued relative to paper assets, but that's not going to uh, be the case in reality until uh, the system collapses. And the system is going to collapse. I know I've been saying this for a very long time. A lot of people have been saying this for a very long time. I'm actually going to read another article uh, about the coming collapse, but before I do that, I want to take a look at what's going on in the bonds and we go from a pretty ugly chart here you can see this is the 10-year note on Finviz and you can see that uh, that decline that we had has now resumed uh, if we put it up on the daily you can see that we could we started to kind of consolidate now although the 10-year is ugly it, it gets uglier as we go down the yield curve. So you can see the five years clearly breaking down and then the two year is even worse. Um, the move today in the two year you can see that big huge red candlestick and the weekly looks really bad. The monthly doesn't look that bad because the perspective is so skewed with it being so high for so long. But you can see it, it's looking like a serious breakdown. The other thing that you want to look at on the monthly chart is you can see down here the volume. The volume on this breakdown, this is the highest volume we've ever seen in uh, on that selling in the two-year note. Same thing with the five-year note. You can see that record volume on this sell-off. Ten-year note, same thing, record volume. And then the 30-year bond which is not really, it's kind of a virtual instrument. They pretty much retired it. It's not really active. but So the main one is the 10-year note, but the, the big carnage here is on the short end of the yield curve. And so the market is sort of front-running what it's expecting from the Fed. Now, I pointed out before that I ex fully expected them to follow their election year cycle pattern you, uh, not not uh, the four-year, but the eight-year election cycle, because that it's not when we have an election, but when we have when we have a changing of the guard. And you can see it right here: 2000, 2008, and now 2016. Um, the difference between those is that uh, on the previous ones, we had rates falling into that election cycle, actually falling into a financial crisis which caused a massive lowering of interest rates. And then back again in 2008, a huge response of money printing. And now we're just starting to collapse after the election is over. So it looks like I've been expecting that they may just crash the whole thing and blame it on Trump. That's a, looking like a pretty good possibility. So let's look at this article from the 
uh, bleep hits the fan, and it's called "Are You Living in a Death Spiral?" But before we do that, I want to look at Venezuela real quick here. Now, Madman Maduro down there in Venezuela has decided to uh, ban cash, and these notes here, I believe that the hundred Bolivar banknote, uh, I think they're only worth three cents. But um, we had a tremendous rally in the value of the Bolivar on the black market just because they're expecting so many to be taken off uh, the market. But with this drastic move, so let's read some of this. It's not the sort of quantitative easing approach you read in any economic textbooks, but Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro has apparently found an innovative way to halt his country's slide into hyperinflation. Over the weekend, Maduro abruptly outlawed the 100 Bolivar banknote, the largest denomination of the country's currency, giving Venezuelans until Thursday to deposit or exchange the bills before they are rendered worthless. Now think about that. The most valuable banknote in the country is worth three cents. That pretty much tells you everything you need to know. Calling the bills instruments of an economic coup to destabilize his government he said the move would strike a blow at international mafias that have been hoarding cash. So the problem is not all the cash that Maduro's been printing. It's the cash that's being hoarded by the international mafias. This guy's just an absolute nutcase. And with a wave of his hand, Venezuela's long-suffering currency stopped sinking Tuesday and it regained nearly 17% of its black market value by late afternoon. Not that that was a cause for celebration. Line stretched for hours outside banks on Tuesday as Venezuelans arrived with stacks of 100 Bolivar notes in backpacks and shopping bags rushing to turn them in before Thursday's deadline. Many businesses stopped accepting the bills immediately and families that have been saving up cash for holiday purchases scrambled to deposit or exchange the bills to avoid losing everything. So here we go. Uh, this is the typical leftist solution for the gigantic problems that they create with their money printing is to ban cash. We're starting to see this come, waves of this coming around the world now with the central planners. Uh, their systems are collapsing, so they're having to take the next step. So let's look at this death spiral article. Are you living in a living in a death spiral? These six states will collapse during the next recession. Being on the hook is not going to be pretty when interest rates are raised back up and debts come due. At a personal level, it will mean more stress and juggling to make ends meet. For the larger economy, it will mean cities and states unable to meet obligations or balance their budgets, ending in bankruptcy and bailouts. Meanwhile, millions of people are relying on that money to keep coming in order to survive. That's something that I've talked about so much is the dependency that uh, was built during the Obama administration. Incredible dependency built during those eight years that Obama's been in office. Something is going to go very wrong. Relying upon government to function and send you money is not a secure plan. The mathematics are terrifying and dismal and so is being caught up in these collapsing states. In the next phase of the financial crisis, the debt super cycle will become the most defining feature of the big hurt that will fall on nearly everyone. That's a dire warning Goldman Sachs issued about what they termed the third wave of the global collapse, but it hasn't come, at least not yet. This wave is characterized by rock bottom commodity prices, stalling growth in China and other emerging market economies, and low global inflation. Goldman Sachs analyst Peter Oppenheimer said, This triple whammy has its roots in the response to the first two waves of crisis, the banking collapse and the European sovereign debt crisis, and is all part of the so-called debt super cycle of the past few decades. Unfunded liabilities for pensions and other state benefits are threatening the security and future of an entire generation of retiring, hardworking Americans. The debt will be shifted for as long as possible, but eventually someone will have to come to terms with it. The black hole totals up to huge sums of money no one can pay. The system is bankrupted, or services rendered become inadequate and farcical. Forbes contributor William Baldwin describes an acute problem of death spiral states, which could actually be as bad as it sounds. It affects dozens of cities and municipalities 
as well. Does your state have more takers than makers? Check it out. California has a powerful economy with 14 million private sector jobs. It also has burdens. 12.6 million welfare recipients, generously paid government employees of 2.1 million, and 1.3 million people collecting government pensions. Add up the numbers, and there's 114 clients drawing from the government for every 100 people chipping in by working outside the government and paying taxes. We're calling this the feed me ratio. Six states have a number over 100. These states are at risk of going into a downward spiral in the next recession. The burdens will remain, but too many of the providers, employers in the private sector might shrink or decamp. Right now, the biggest risk for a bankruptcy or collapse is in these states, based on the ratio between what Baldwin terms makers and takers. You remember that was the term that pretty much cost Romney the election in 2012. Basically, the socialist state is enveloping all prosperity. And you can see here's the states here, New Mexico, West Virginia, California, Mississippi, New York, and Arkansas. And New Mexico up here with an unbelievable 148 people live off the government for every 100 taxpayers. So that's way, way out of balance. That's not a safety net. A safety net is something like insurance where you have a small percentage of people who experience an unusual occurrence, um, let's say 10%, 15%. That's actually high for most types of insurance. Like if you're talking about something like fire insurance or auto insurance where you're insured against an accident or a fire, uh, it's probably one in a hundred um, for people's houses burning down, um, maybe one in a thousand. So this is a ratio here of 1.5 to one. That's a ridiculous ratio. There is no way that can continue. And you can see it's bad. Uh, all the, the rest of these are over a hundred. And you can see with California and New York, I'm pretty sure Chicago's up there too. Uh, here's for the cities. Detroit and Chicago top the list of cities who wouldn't be healthy in the ratio of makers-takers either and would crumble in a debt crunch. You can check your state on this interactive map. A score under 100 means that the state has a net number of providers and is theoretically on more solid ground. However, the pressures are endemic in the system and no state is immune. For instance, Texas has a healthy score of 66.7, yet, Dal yet Dallas just announced it's suspending the pension payments to city rescue workers and employees. There's a serious disconnect. And so, and then just goes into a lot of doom stuff. So uh, there is going to be a death spir spiral. There's no question about it. Uh, when you're talking about more takers than makers, when you're talking about more people riding in the cart than people pulling the cart, and one thing that happens when you start to approach that one-to-one -one ratio is it actually swings much more quickly than it got there because uh, it, it just becomes so punitive to support the system when such a large percentage of what you earn is taken to support people who don't work. That's where we're going and what is it going to result in? Probably something like what we're seeing now in Venezuela, where the response initially is to print up an enormous amount of money to deal with all of the debts that the government has uh, and all the promises that the government has made until that currency begins to drastically lose value. And uh, then you have to have a reaction like this, which is seizing the money. That's ultimately what the governments are forced to do is seize private wealth that, again, is why you want to have your money out of the system. Once again, I don't think gold is going to be a good bet. We have to wait and see if we get through this 1100 price because the downward pressure on gold right now is tremendous. Uh, like I said, the downward pressure on silver has already happened. Yes, silver could make a new low down here around 14. I seriously doubt that that's going to happen. I think the, the crisis is going to happen before that happens. If it does, if we do get a price of 12, look at it as an incredible gift because 
when things finally go into the death spiral, then uh, the price, the value of these precious metals is going to be just that you won't even be able to calculate it. And we'll talk to you next time.